thing junk, but mostly just junk junk. <laughs> There's so much of that. So Chris, just let us know when you want us to start. Okay, we're, I'm going to just let people in now. Okay. Yep, it's Sounds seven o'clock. Sounds good. Yeah, um, yeah we're, so we're all set. Excellent. Thank you. Right, Someday you're going to have to teach me how to do all this. <laughs> And we're going to wait a few minutes just to mm -hmm. let people wander yeah, in. I see we've only got three attendees there. Oh, there's somebody I know. Oh, good. You can tell? Because I can't tell. How can you tell? Oh, I, I clicked on participants, so I've got the list of names next to the screen image. Well, I don't. <laughs> I don't have a list of names. I just have, a, oh yeah, I could if I went over to attendees, I guess I could, yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Someone is saying to, hi, Bob, to you. Yeah, yes, that's, <laughs> that's, that's the name I recognize. Hi, Eugene. That's cute. Oh, but now somebody's typing in the chat. Are we just... Yep. Might be the that might be what we yeah. just saw. Yeah, just, that's what we just yeah. saw. Mm -hmm. Oh goodness! Excuse me, my phone is. Okay, Becca says she's on her way. There was an accident on two ninety four. <laughs> Always. <laughs> yeah. Right. Always is right. I just heard there's an intersection by me that's closed because there's a gas main break at the intersection. Oh no, good grief. Fortunately, I'm not going anywhere. And there's Rebecca. What's wrong? Oh, oh, <laughs> oh no. Give it a couple more minutes, see if we get a couple more people. Okay. And if not. Um, for the person who's asking if we're going to record, yes, it is being recorded. It also it's streaming live on Facebook, and then it should be on the Eisenhower Library Facebook page. So if you if you lose part of it, you should still be able to get it. And oh my goodness, there's four four kids and two adults. For this that's fantastic. Thank you. I think we'll go ahead. I'm just gonna just do a quick introduction here. Um, my name is Penny and that's from Eisenhower Library and we thank you very much for coming tonight. Um, we're doing the history of the US space program, which I'm sure you know. I'm going to do I'm going to do a quick introduction for Bob here. And he I don't know if you want me to tell where you live. Do you want me to tell him where you live? Doesn't matter to me. <laughs> okay, Bob lives in Dundee. He is a ambassador for the um, for NASA. He's been interested in rockets and space science since the start of the manned space program. He's a model rocket flyer. He's flown rockets since 1964. He's flown high power rockets since 1989. And he's competed in rocket events for over four decades. He just told me he sent his, his Tesla model in, into two rockets and, and it came back both times. Bob is interested in space flight, astronomy, observing Earth satellites and green technology. And professionally, he has a computer science engineering degree from Northwestern University and three decades of experience in the IT industry. And he is a collector of old computer equipment. Now, we are in webinar format, you guys. So that means that you should be muted and your camera should be off. 
If you do have any questions, if you could drop them into the Q&A, that would be fabulous. We do have a couple of spots during the presentation where Bob will stop and take questions. So if you drop them in, we will get to them at that point, and then we'll have time for questions again at the end. Um, Q&A is better than chat. It's a little bit easier to keep track of the questions that way, but if you feel that you must put them in chat, I will try to keep an eye on that as for you as well, okay? So now, Bob, I think if you start your screen share, I'm going to disappear. Okay. We're all going to disappear. Okay, is that showing up for everybody? Oh, that muted everybody. No, that no, you are you are showing up. That looks great. Okay, great. Okay. Uh, again, I am Bob Kaplan, I'm a NASA JPL Solar System Ambassador, amongst other things. And wait, oh, there we go. Uh, wasn't listening to my forward and backward keys. So we're going to talk about the history of the space program, the space race, men in space, working in space, getting to the moon, living in space, and then exploring the solar system. So some of the questions that we're going to find answers to in here, you can see in front of you. And I'm going to use the international definition of space for my talk, which is 100 kilometers, which is about 62 miles. So really the first person to do the math, so to speak, and figure out what it would take to get into space was a uh, Russian rocket scientist, Konstantin Tsiolkovsky. He came up with this rocket equation that is still used today to figure out what we're gonna do. What this graph is telling us is that if we wanna get into space, we need a very high mass ratio. So if you look at a rocket like the Saturn V that took us to the moon, and actually, I have a very small model of one here. But if you look at this a rocket like this, or the space shuttle, or the Falcon 9 that's going to be launched in a couple of days to take astronauts to the space station, somewhere on the order of 90 to 95 percent of the weight of that rocket is fuel. Unless you've got a number that's close to 100 percent, you're not going to get to space. 50 percent isn't going to get you there. 10% isn't even going to get you close. The first rocket to reach space were the German V2s during World War II, built as a weapon, but later used for doing some research. Uh, the first satellite in space was the Russian Sputnik 1 in October of 1957, followed a month later by Sputnik 2, which carried a dog into space. A uh, picture of a, the Sputnik satellite. Uh, this is obviously not the one that flew into space. This is the model that's in the Smithsonian in DC. Uh, obviously, it's a little hard to get pictures of stuff in space. Essentially, this one only spent, oh, I don't even remember. It was in space for, it was functioning for, I think, a few weeks. It was in orbit for a bit longer, but it eventually it dropped back down to the Earth and burned up. The US tried to get into space with the Vanguard rocket. Unfortunately, it rather blew up rather spectacularly on live TV. Ironically, though, one of the later Vanguard rockets is the oldest object currently in Earth orbit today. It's still up there. US finally did get into space with the Explorer 1 satellite uh, launched by a Jupiter rocket, which was both, both the Russian and US early rockets were all ballistic missile launchers. Uh, interesting story between Sputnik and the US. Uh, there's some, th there's lots of speculation as to what actually went on back then. And uh, one of the interesting stories I heard more recently is that Eisenhower deliberately held the US space program back because he was worried about what the Russian response to having a satellite that would overfly Russia multiple times every day. So by letting the Russians go first and then not reacting, we basically declared that space was open to everybody and it, the, terror, the space over the United States wasn't United States territory. The space over the Soviet Union wasn't Soviet Union's territory. It was open for everybody. If we had launched first, it might've started World War III. At any rate, Explorer 1, uh, uh, the this stripe portion here, I think you can see my mouse, is the actual scientific satellite part. This is actually the rocket motor from the final stage that sent it up there. 
and we have uh, Pickering, Van Allen, and Von Braun left to right. Uh, Pickering was the head of JPL who designed the space, the satellite. Uh, Dr. Van Allen was the scientist. Uh, they put a cosmic ray detector in here and it, this discovered what are now known as the Van Allen radiation belts. Von Braun, of course, was the German rocket scientist that built the V2 and was responsible for most of the US early rocket development uh, up through getting to the moon. On the heels of launching this satellite, uh, NASA was created out of the old NACA to uh, handle all of our space program. And we started sending some things into space. So we sent Pioneer 4 in March of 59 that flew past the moon, went into solar orbit. Of course, anything that's in solar orbit essentially is going to stay there forever. So this is still there, but I don't think we're able to track it at this point. We started sending weather satellites into space. This is one of the most useful uses of space technology. Uh, the weather satellites gave us much more detailed information so we can now much more accurately predict and track hurricanes, thus saving lives. Telstar, the first communication satellite that enabled uh, TV signals to be sent between Europe and the United States. And then we started sending people into space. So America selected its first seven astronauts. I don't know how many times I saw this picture. And actually, it wasn't until I was putting a presentation together two years ago for the 50th anniversary of the moon landing. And I went to caption this picture with names that I realized they're lined up in alphabetical order left to right. So left to right, we've got uh, Scott Carpenter, Gordon Cooper, John Glenn, Gus Grissom, Wally Schirra, Alan Shepard, and Deke Slayton, who got grounded and didn't get to fly until later. Also wonder about John Glenn's boots in this picture. They look a little different. But one of the first spacecraft was actually the X-15. It started flying in 1959. And in 1963, it made two flights that reached that 100 kilometer, 62 mile altitude. And Joe Walker got his astronaut wings from that. And several other later astronauts from the space program uh, flew the X-15, uh, although not to the uh, 100 kilometer altitude, but the US awarded astronaut wings for the folks that reached 50 mile altitude. So this was actually our first reusable rocket manned rocket. Uh, in April of 1961, Yuri Gagarin made his first one orbit flight. Again, beat the Russians beat the US into, spa into space with people. Uh, the US was right behind. In May of 61, Alan Shepard made his first flight. Now, Gagarin orbited the Earth once. Alan Shepard and Gus Grissom, a couple months later, went up a couple hundred miles and came down. These were 15 minute suborbital flights instead of orbiting the Earth. Initially, the US was behind the Russians because the Russians had bigger rockets. And the reason they had bigger rockets is all of these rockets were developed to send nuclear weapons at each other. And the Russians had bigger nuclear weapons, so they needed bigger rockets to fly them. That gave them an initial advantage in launching larger spacecraft into space. Uh, but on the heels of one 15 minute flight, John Kennedy made this bold goal of getting a man to the moon and back safely before the end of the decade. And when he set this goal, he knew we were behind and he consulted with his space experts, including Lyndon Johnson, who's sitting behind him and he wanted, he was, he really didn't care about space travel. He was looking for something to make the U.S. look good. He was looking for a goal that was difficult enough that we couldn't do it right away, but far enough out that we still had a good chance of doing this before the Russians. So, we started sending more men into space. Uh, now we're using the Atlas booster, which is this silver and white rocket. The white is mostly frost and the mercury capsule on top. 
Uh, John Glenn made three orbits of the Earth in February of 62. Scott Carpenter repeated that in May of 62. Wally Sharam made six orbits of the Earth later that year. And, and then in 63, Gordon Cooper made 22 orbits, which was about a day and a half in space. That was the longest American space flight at that point. While we were sending Mercury astronauts into space, we sent several other probes looking at the moon because that's where we were trying to go to. So the Ranger was a TV camera that was designed to fly to the moon and actually crash into the moon. It had no chance to land. It would crash into the moon, but sending back TV pictures all the way. <clears throat> the first six of them failed. Atlas rockets blew up. Uh, the cameras didn't work. There were numerous problems with them, but finally seven, eight, and nine succeeded, impacted the moon, and returned TV pictures that look like this. So much more detailed than we can get from Earth, but not as detailed as we would see later. We also had Surveyor, which landed on the moon. Amongst other things, we needed to, we actually wanted to put something on the moon. Could the moon support a spacecraft? We didn't know. After we landed Surveyor on the moon, we knew. Uh, you can see it's got this little shovel here, so it could dig a trench in the moon. It had a TV camera to send back pictures. We'll talk about this picture again because there's something else going on here that we're going to come back to. So that's what went on <clears throat> during the early 60s with the Mercury program. So at this point, I'm going to ask if there's any questions. Excuse me a moment. <coughs> Any questions out there? Penny, Chris? I don't see anything right now. Okay. Um, but let me double check in the Q&A there was. Sure. Mm -hmm. um, no, not right now. Just, not right now. Still just, pretty early on, so I, I usually get more, get more later on. So now we needed to learn how to work in space and do things. In order to get to the moon, there were three things we had to learn how to do that we hadn't done before. Number one, we needed flights that instead of one day, they were on the order of six to 14 days because getting to the moon was going to be a much longer trip. Number two, we needed to learn how to rendezvous and dock in space. We had to have two spacecraft connect up together. And three, we had to learn how to do spacewalks. So this brought us to the Gemini program. And again, we're using missile technology that was built to, to, during the Cold War. So now we're using the Titan II rocket and we've got the Gemini capsule on top of it that carries two people. First flew in, <clears throat> excuse me, March of 1965 with Grissom who was one of the Mercury astronauts and John Young. John Young would later walk on the moon and fly the space shuttle. Gemini IV was our first spacewalk and again, the Russians, when the Russians heard we were going to do it, they rushed and beat us by a month and did a spacewalk earlier. So McDivitt and White spent four days in space. Ed White took his first spacewalk. He was only out for about a little over 20 minutes, about 22 minutes. Really didn't want to come back in. He enjoyed it a lot, but he was just out there. He wasn't doing anything useful. He was just, can we survive outside the spacecraft? Yes, we can. Gemini 5 was our first really long duration mission. So we pushed it up to eight days in space, which was really at the low end of what a lunar landing flight was gonna take. Uh, Gordon Cooper and Conrad flew this flight. And here you see them after they've been in space for a little over a week. Gemini 6 was supposed to do the first rendezvous and docking in space, but uh, we've got another Atlas rocket, this time with an Agena on top that they were gonna dock with and the rocket blew up. So what are we gonna do? So what they decided to do was to launch Gemini 7 first and then as quick as possible, turn things around and launch Gemini 6 afterwards. So they launched Gemini 7 on December 4th. It spent 14 days in space, which until we got to Skylab remained as the record for time in space. Here's two guys stuck in 
the smallest car you could imagine, almost shoulder to shoulder, couldn't get up, couldn't stretch out, couldn't do anything for 14 days. Not a very comfortable trip. But they spent 14 days in orbit. And uh, let's see, 11 days later, they launched Gemini 6, which rendezvoused with it. Actually tried to launch it two days earlier. They ignited the rocket. It shut down. They had to fix the problem. Two days later, they, re they tried again, got it off successfully. But they managed to succeed with their first rendezvous, but no docking. First docking didn't happen until Gemini 8. So again, we've got this Agena that was launched by the Atlas. It's in orbit. Armstrong and Scott rendezvoused with it, docked with it. But as soon as they docked, they encountered a problem. They started tumbling in space. They thought the problem was with the Agena. So they immediately undocked. And the problem got worse instead of better. And they had to fight to regain control of the spacecraft. It turns out one of the thrusters on the Gemini spacecraft had stuck on. And until they found out what the problem was, they, they were fighting the controls almost to the point of blacking out. Uh, so this was our first in-flight space emergency. They handled it, aborted the mission, and came back immediately. Uh, Gemini 9 was supposed to have C and Bassett for their crew. Uh, the capsule was built at McDonnell Douglas in St. Louis. They flew down there to check out their capsule. The weather was bad. Uh, they lost orientation and actually ended up crashing into the factory that was building their spacecraft and were killed. So for the first time we had to replace a crew and the back, normally the way NASA scheduled things is the backup crew for each flight became the prime crew for three missions later. So the Gemini 12 crew was the backup for this flight and they ended up flying the flight. So that was uh, Stafford and Cernan. And again, they had problems. Uh, there was a problem with the Agena, so they had to do a replacement. So they had just this adapter with a docking adapter on it. And the shroud over the adapter didn't come off. It was too dangerous to appro approach and try and knock off. They ended up calling this thing the angry alligator. So this was, we, we had a flight that was supposed to dock where the Agena blew up and they did a rendezvous instead. We had the successful docking, but an emergency immediately after. And now our third attempt at doing a docking, we ended up with this. So we had another rendezvous with no docking. Uh, but we did have a spacewalk on this flight. And uh, I remember hearing Gene Cernan talk a couple times. And his comment after this flight is he, and he's from the Chicago area, by the way. Uh, trying to remember, grew up in, uh, well, near Triton College because they named their planetarium after him. Uh, he thought he was the biggest screw up around when he had problems with his spacewalk. Uh, got exhausted, couldn't, his helmet was fogging up. Nothing was working right. It was extremely difficult. Everything he tried to do didn't work and incredibly dangerous situation. Well, Gemini 10 finally did a successful docking and were able to refire that Agena and change their orbit, which was one of the objectives they had to accomplish. But Collins had the same problem with his EVA. Nothing worked right. He couldn't move around, uh, couldn't, whatever he tried to do, lots of problems. So the, this EVA was turning out to be a bigger problem than they thought. Uh, Gemini 11 with Conrad and Gordon, again, a successful rendezvous and docking. Again, difficulty with the EVA, but they, when they reignited that Agena rocket, they flew to 851 miles back in 1966. That record still stands as the highest altitude for manned orbit around the Earth. Now to put this in perspective, the space shuttle and the space station are in the 250 to 300 mile range. The moon is a thousand times farther from the earth than where the space station is and where we've been flying other than when we used uh, this Agena rocket to boost them higher, where the space shuttle flew, it's a thousand times farther to go to the moon. So they successfully did the rendezvous and docking, but they still had trouble 
with the spacewalks. Well, the folks that solved the problem were Lovell and Aldrin on the last Gemini flight, Gemini 12. Now remember, the Gemini 12 crew ended up flying Gemini 9. So this was put together afterwards as a backfill uh, to fly this mission. And I heard Lovell and Aldrin talk at an Adler event a number of years ago. And they were talking about this. The two of them were both scuba divers. And they had the idea that when you're scuba diving, you're in a neutral, buoyant environment. It's very much like being weightless. And their idea was that if we trained in the water, we could learn how to do these things before we got into space. Because there was really no place on Earth where you could be weightless for long periods of time. And they learned a lot by doing that. They learned that in order to move around, you need handholds, you need foot restraints. So they put all of these things on the spacecraft. And Aldrin was able to accomplish all of the tasks he set out to do that had been problems on those three previous EVAs. So this got us to the Gemini program. At this point, we've done the long duration flights. We've done the rendezvous and the docking. And finally, with Gemini 12, we've had a successful EVA where somebody has been able to work in, this, in space. So that brings us to the end of the Gemini program. I'm going to pause for a second and see if we got any questions yet. No, we have a very quiet group. We have a very quiet crowd. <laughs> but that's OK. okay. <laughs> that's OK. I see we got a few more people that came in since I was just going to say we did get a few yep. more people. I see the number is 23 now instead of I think yes. it was 17 when I looked at it before. Oh, wait, I'm sorry. There are a couple of things in the queue. Oh, there are. Just okay. popped in. Um, one it says the Russians, unlike the Americans, kept their space program very secret. So when I was watching all this as a kid in the 60s, there was a lot of speculation whether the Russians were actually achieving what they said. For example, did they actually do space fall? but now we know more. Yeah, I, th there was a lot of speculation. It, it was all secret. They never announced anything until after the fact. One of the things that wasn't known until many years later is that that first orbit, the first flight by Gagarin, would not meet the current requirements for the FAI to recognize it as a space flight because they hadn't worked out the landing system for the space, those spacecraft. They were landing on the ground. And he actually ejected out of the spacecraft before it landed. Oh. Uh, and this wasn't known until relatively recently. I, I don't know when it was first discovered, but you know we now know that. Uh, I'm not sure if we actually know to date about any fatalities they had in their early space program. We certainly know about some of the later ones, and I'm about to get to that. Was there another question there, or was that the only one? There's a hi, Bob, from Kristen. Oh. <laughs> and there is a question of, what does EVA stand for? Sorry. I'm, so, I'm sorry. N NASA is loaded with acronyms, and I use lots of them thinking everybody knows what they are. Extravehicular activity, AKA a spacewalk. Okay. All right. Okay. I think that's everything we have for okay. right Are now. We're good to go here. Mm -hmm. All right. So let's move on to Apollo. Well, Apollo didn't have, Apollo was now the program that was going to get us to the moon, carry three men, and it had a very rough start. The first Apollo flight, about a month before they were ready to fly, everybody was down at the Cape. They were checking out the spacecraft. They hadn't fueled the rocket, but they were going through the full countdown. And there were a lot of design problems with the spacecraft. Uh, and one of the big ones turned out to be that it was a pure oxygen environment at 15 pounds per square inch, which is the atmosphere we're in. But our atmosphere is only 20% oxygen. Here we're at 100% oxygen, but at the same pressure we're at. Uh, if you're pure oxygen, you only need one fifth the pressure in order to support life. And there was, there was some loose wiring or something in the cabin. It started a fire. Uh, they couldn't, the hatch was designed to open inward instead of outward. So when you get a fire in the cabin, it builds up pressure. They couldn't open the hatch. And the three astronauts were burned to death instantly. Uh, shortly thereafter, the Russian Soyuz spacecraft that was supposed to be 
their moon spacecraft crashed, killing its pilot, uh, Komarov. So both programs suffered tragedies and setbacks in the six, in 67. They redesigned the whole Apollo spacecraft after that. And in October of 1968, Apollo 7 took off with three astronauts on board, Shira Eisling Cunningham. Got to meet uh, Cunningham uh, about a decade ago. So here's three guys that are brave enough to get into a spacecraft where the last three people that got into it burned to death. And they spent 11 days in space in a brand new spacecraft. Checked it out. Uh, it, I mean, there's, there's always issues with a new spacecraft, but it performed amazingly well for those 11 days, uh, which let NASA do something absolutely spectacular. The next flight was supposed to be another Earth orbit flight, this time with the lunar module to check out the lunar module. But the lunar module wasn't ready yet. It was behind schedule and it was overweight. So they made this really bold move to take the Saturn V moon rocket, put an Apollo command and service module on top of it and send it to the moon for the, for the first manned flight of the Saturn V. It had only made two flights previously and to send a man to the moon. Very high risk flight, but they thought it was worth the risk. And these folks were risk takers, both the management and the astronauts. They're all, they're all test pilots at this point. Uh, they're used to taking risks. So on, on end of December, 1968, these three men flew around the moon. And I, you know, I grew up with all of this stuff. I remember seeing them orbiting the moon I remember them reading from Genesis on Christmas Eve. I remember this picture. You've probably seen this picture before printed sideways from the way I show it. But the orientation they were in, if you look at this line on the Earth, that's the Terminator. That's the line between the light and the dark part of the Earth. That line always runs north to south. So while you've seen the picture before the other way, this was the orientation they actually saw it and this, the orientation they actually took the picture in. So I always put it in this orientation because that's what they actually saw. Uh, one of the other interesting space spinoffs people don't realize, uh, from 68 to 72, flying to the moon, we took a bunch of pictures of what is now referred to as the blue marble. But this was the first one to show it like this. And they commented, you reach out with your thumb and your thumb would cover the whole earth. And people finally realized by going to the moon, what a small, fragile environment the Earth that we lived on was. And it was one of these pictures that became the symbol for Earth Day less than a year and a half later, and still is. So Earth Day and the ecology movement very much was a space spinoff. And we're coming up on, actually, I think, I think today is actually Earth Day. So Apollo 9, McDivitt, Scott, and Schweikert, uh, 10 days in Earth orbit, Saturn V again, but now the lunar module made its first flight. So the lunar module is actually a two-piece spacecraft. It's got a descent stage on the bottom and an ascent stage on the top. So the whole thing separates from the command module where the astronauts are, takes two people down to the lunar surface, lands, and then the top half takes off, returns to the lunar orbit, has to dock with the command module to come back here. So this was checking out the lunar module in Earth orbit for the first time. So they fired the engine, moved away, separated, fired the engine, came back, docked, and then returned to Earth. So now we finally checked out the lunar module. Apollo 10 did the same thing, but did it in lunar orbit. So Apollo 8 was in orbit about 60 miles above the surface of the moon. On this flight, Stafford and, Stafford and Cernan dropped down to within 10 miles of the moon while Young remained in the command module. The lunar module was still overweight. It didn't have, it was short fueled, so they couldn't land, but they could check it out. And they, they basically laid out the roadmap and the trail for Neil Armstrong to follow a couple months later. And Neil Armstrong always credited them with laying down the roadmap for them him to get there. So two months later, July of 1969, Saturn V takes off with Armstrong, Alden, and Collins on board. 
Uh, this is still the largest, most powerful rocket ever flown. And everything worked and they got to the moon. Had some problems along the way. Uh, while they were landing, there were lots of error messages going off in the lunar module. The computer was being overworked because somebody had accidentally turned on the rendezvous radar, the rendezvous radar that they used during the ascent to get back to the command module. And that was overloading the computer. Fortunately, the error messages coming out, somebody had seen in one of the simulations just before this mission and knew what to do about them and knew that they didn't have to abort when they got those errors. So they set foot on the moon. Uh, they laid out some experiments. Whoops. Uh, so here you can see Aldrin coming down the lunar lander after Armstrong's already on the moon. They put out a flag, they put out some experiments. There's one, ex there's one thing that all of the Apollo missions left on the moon that is still functioning today. It's called a corner cube reflector. If you look at a cube, a sugar cube, uh, you know, a block, anything like that. If you look at the corner with those three surfaces at 90 degree angles, if you set up three mirrors at 90 degree angles like that, any beam of light that comes in, comes back the same path it came in on. So one of the things we can still do today is bounce using a telescope, bounce laser beams off those corner cubes that were left behind during the Apollo program. And by doing that, we've actually been able to measure that the moon is very slowly moving further and further away from the earth. Apollo 12 uh, in November of 69, they had a problem 37 seconds after launch. Uh, it was struck by lightning. And fortunately, that did not affect the computers that controlled the Saturn V rocket, but it messed up everything in the command module. And again, one very smart controller back in Houston looked at what he saw on the screen, said, I'd seen this before. And he said, try SCE to AUX. Nobody else knew what he was talking about, but they radioed and these, these guys all trust each other. When somebody says something with confidence, they trust this guy. They didn't know he was talking about, but they relayed the instructions back to the capsule. Uh, Conrad, who was the commander, didn't know what it was. Gordon, who was the command module pilot, he didn't know what it was. Alan Bean, who was the lunar module pilot, knew what this switch in the command module was, I guess because it was sitting in front of him on his side of the spacecraft flipped the switch, they got all the data back and everything worked good from there. But they were able to land on the moon. And actually, uh, if we wanna back up a second, uh, they made a, when Neil Armstrong landed on the moon, it was bringing him down in a field of boulders. He had to take control and actually fly the ship and land someplace else. So if we go back far enough here, remember this picture I said I would talk about? This is the Apollo 12 lunar module sitting on the moon. This picture was taken by the Apollo 12 astronauts on the moon. They made a precision landing, actually not by Surveyor 1, but by Surveyor 3, I believe. So this isn't actually Surveyor 1 in the picture, this is 3. But they landed right by that. So they were able to observe a spacecraft that had been sitting on the moon for three years. They also became the first space vandals. They uh, stole some pieces of it and brought them back. So you can actually see the camera that was on this spacecraft sitting in the Smithsonian in Washington, DC right now. So let's get back to where I jumped out of. All right, so Apollo 12 had a problem, but was successful and landed. Apollo 13 was the big problem. Uh, uh, halfway to the moon, an oxygen tank exploded in the service module, blew this whole panel out of the side damaged their oxygen supply, their electric supply, and they didn't know what else uh, meant they couldn't use the engine on there anymore, which is what they needed to get into orbit around the moon and get back from the moon. They ended up using the lunar module as a lifeboat. Uh, engineers on the ground had to figure out lots of solutions to lots of problems for them to get back safely. Interesting comment I heard from uh, Fred Hayes just two years ago, I think it was. He was doing a talk. After every flight, they have this checklist of all the problems and what to do about them. And they have this discussion about what went wrong and what they need to fix. 
the Apollo 13 checklist was actually the second shortest list of all of the Apollo flights. They had one really big problem, but fortunately for everybody, they didn't have any other problems or very few and just minor problems. Otherwise, they probably wouldn't have made it back. Uh, now, it was a failure, but it was a successful failure. Uh, Apollo 14 uh, now spent more time on the moon. It was a 10-day flight. They did two EVAs walking on the moon. They had this little golf cart thing to drag equipment around. So Shepard, who was the only of the original Mercury astronauts to walk on the moon, and Ed Mitchell uh, made these two EVAs while uh, Rusa continued to orbit the moon in uh, the command module. They always left somebody up in the command module and two people came down to the moon. Whenever we've done an EVA since Gemini, it's always been two people in pairs. Just like when you go scuba diving, you always go in pairs. Uh, uh, Alan Shepard also was a golfer and brought a golf club that attached to one of his tools so that he could hit some golf balls on the moon. He claimed they went miles and miles. And just like any other golfer uh, has been known to stretch the truth, uh, some recent pictures showed that they uh, only went about 30 or 40 meters. So they didn't go anywhere near as far as he said he did. they did. Apollo 15 had the lunar rover. Uh, so now they could drive on the moon. Actually, and uh, you'll notice something else here. Uh, I think 13 had it, but 14 was the first. This is a black and white picture, but you can see some stripes on the suit here. And I think here, one of the things they learned during these moonwalks is they couldn't tell which astronaut was which. So ever since then, the commanders had red stripes on their suit. And even with the uh, space shuttle and now ISS spacewalks, one of the suits has red stripes on them so they can tell them apart. So Apollo 15 uh, spent 12 days on the moon, actually did three and a half EVAs if you want to get technical. One of the things that all of the astronauts that went to the moon did is they got geology training so that they could study the moon. And one of the things that uh, Dave Scott learned from his instructor is the instructor taught him that when you get to a new site you've never been to before, he said, the first thing you wanna do is stick your head up and look around to see what you got here. And then you can plan where you're gonna go to do your exploring. So after they landed on the moon, before they went to sleep for the night, they opened up the hatch on the top of the lunar module, which is normally used for just docking with the command module. And he stuck his head out like a woodchuck and looked around to see what he had. Uh, but they did three AVAs with, with the rover. One of the rules for EVAs on the lunar surface is you could never go farther from the lunar module, that's your trip home, that's your lifeboat, then you could walk back with the amount of oxygen you had left. So that when they did an excursion on the moon, instead of going out and stopping on the way, they went out to the farthest point, explored there, and then worked their way back. So that if there was a problem, if the rover broke down, you can't call AAA on the moon, they, could, they would have enough oxygen to walk back to their lunar module and be able to come home. Apollo 16 repeated this, but in a much more interesting geographical area, uh, lunar highlands. So uh, John Young, who uh, made two Gemini flights and had flown earlier in Apollo and ended up flying the space shuttle. Uh, and Charlie Duke walked on the moon. Uh, you might remember from Apollo 13, Don Mattingly, uh, well, Charlie Duke was the guy who came down with the measles from the backup crew, and again, Apollo 13's backup crew would fly Apollo 16. Mattingly was originally part of the Apollo 13 crew, but hadn't had the measles, so he didn't have immunity. So they bumped him from the plight and replaced him with Jack Swikert. So fortunate for Mattingly that he got bumped to this flight and uh, didn't end up on Apollo 13. Uh, but they explored some of these uh, more interesting geologic. We, we, the first couple flights to the moon were about getting to the moon and getting back. Uh, these last three flights were about doing science on the moon. So more involved things, the rover let them do more. Apollo 17 ended up being our last flight to the moon. The interesting thing they discovered here, you can see 
instead of gray, there's some color in the rocks. Uh, one of those other stories I heard is uh, everybody remembers what Neil Armstrong said when he got to the moon, but nobody remembers what Buzz Aldrin said because he was second. And what he said was magnificent desolation. I mean, the moon is a very desolate environment, spectacular, but they were surprised to find color in the rocks. Because this was the last flight to the moon, uh, uh, Joe Engel, who was one of those X-15 pilots, as was Neil Armstrong, by the way, uh, was supposed to be the lunar module pilot on this flight along with Gene Cernan to walk on the moon. He got bumped by Harrison Schmidt, who was actually a scientist astronaut and a trained geologist. There was a lot of pressure from the scientific community if this was going to be the last flight to actually send a geologist to the moon. And that's what ended up happening. So uh, Joe Engel did get to fly the space shuttle. Uh, but did not get to walk on the moon. So that was the end of our lunar exploration. And Apollo 18, 19, and 20 were canceled. There were actually plans for more than that. But if you go today to Kennedy Space Center or in Florida, Johnson Space Center in Houston, or the Marshall Space Flight Center in uh, Huntsville, Alabama, you'll see Saturn V sitting on the ground on display. Oh, also, there's a piece of one at uh, the Infinity Science Center in Mississippi. Those are real Saturn V rockets that were supposed to take people to the moon. Unfortunately, they, when they put them on display, they did a mix and match. So there's no intact Apollo 18, Apollo 19, or Apollo 20 anywhere. Uh, each one is pieces from different space or different rockets. So they, they did a mix and match. Uh, kind of unfortunate they didn't put them all together. Uh, the one in Houston was restored a few years ago. And an old friend of mine that I know from my model rocket hobby was actually one of the head people to restore it. He knows that rocket inside and out. So that was the end of the Apollo program, sort of. But we still had some hardware around and did a few things. <clears throat> so we used one of the leftover Saturn V's first and second stage with a dummy third stage to build the Skylab space station and launch that in May of 1973 in low Earth orbit. Uh, unfortunately, on the way up, some of these panels of the Skylab thing, it's got, well, you'll, you'll see it here. Uh, it was supposed to have two of these winged solar panels and one of them ripped off and some of the heat uh, shield that was over here ripped off. So the first thing they had to do on the first flight when they got there is install this heat shield. It was over 100 degrees inside the spacecraft, unlivable. So they had to put this uh, sheet, sun shield over it to protect that area from the sun, cut the wires that had snagged this solar panel. These had opened up, this cross thing at the end where there was a, a telescope opened up, but this one hadn't. So they were a little short on power once they got this open, but without that, they wouldn't have been able to have enough power to complete the missions or, and it wouldn't have been a habitable environment, but they were able to salvage the space station. And three astronauts, Conwood, Conrad, Kerwin, and Whites, spent one month on the space station. Uh, later, Bean, Lausma, and Garriott spent two months. And then on the final flight, Carr, Gibson, and Pogue spent three months. Now, on each of these flights, there was a commander, there was a pilot, and there was a scientist. So Kerwin was an MD. Uh, Garriott, I believe, was a physicist, and Gibson, I believe, was an astronomer. So now we actually had scientists spending time in space doing research in addition to just spending time in space flying. And, and that's pretty much what we've done ever since is we've been sending scientists into space, and all sorts of technical people. The last Apollo spinoff flight was the Apollo Soyuz flight. So this is, uh, I think this picture is actually from the Smithsonian where they had a mock-up. I was at, uh, my first trip to the Kennedy Space Center was a month after this flight, just missed it. But they had a mock-up down there in one of the hangars. So we've got the Apollo Command and Service Module here with its big engine. And instead of a lunar module in that uh, shroud, they put this docking adapter that allowed the Soyuz spacecraft to connect to it. And Alexei Leonov, who was a uh, Russian cosmonaut that made that first spacewalk just before Ed White made his, and Valery Kubasev, 
uh, the five of them got together in space. Now, this is still during the Cold War. This flight may have done more to end the Cold War than anything other than tearing down the Berlin Wall. Uh, uh, Stafford and Leonov both ended up as generals in the US and Soviet military. After this flight, they became best friends, li lifetime friends. Leonov just passed away just in the past year. Uh, I think Stafford and Brand are the only two survivors. Uh, but uh, right up until the end, uh, these two guys were best friends. They would go hunting in Oklahoma. They would go hunting in Russia. They would go fishing. Uh, uh, you know, Cold War enemies that if they saw each other flying military jets would have shot each other down that as a result of space flight became best friends. And, and this continued then with uh, the space program and space stations later on. So that takes us to the end of the Apollo program and its spinoffs. Again, I'm going to open things up to questions and get a drink. I have two comments. One is that um, Earth Day is actually Thursday the 22nd. Oh, so okay. we close. Thank you. Uh, the other is um, that um, Kerwin is from Oak Park. Uh, I don't know that for sure, but that could be. Uh, yeah. Several astronauts are from the Chicago area. I mentioned Gene Cernan. Uh, Jim Lovell is from the Chicago area. His son actually has a restaurant up in uh, right outside the Great Lakes Navy base that I've been to. <laughs> Oh, interesting. Mm -hmm. And then two questions. Actually, One the, is, initially you said the lunar lander was too heavy, but later they took a lunar rover. Did they find a way to increase the Saturn V power later in order to take a lunar rover to the They moon? got the Saturn V to be a little more powerful, and they cut weight out of the lunar module. Okay. And one, one of those other ironies, before the Apollo 11 flight, somebody asked the three astronauts what you'd take to the moon if you could. And I don't remember what answers uh, Aldrin and Collins came up with, you know, whether it was, you know, a book or some artifact or something. But Neil Armstrong seemed to have incredibly good foresight and his answer was more fuel. They landed with less than 15 seconds of fuel left. They were, you know, running on fumes when they finally landed because they had to go past this boulder field when they were landing. Mm -hmm. So uh, interesting answer that turned out to be rather uh, fortune telling. This also is about Saturn V. I remember reading the detailed design of the Saturn V was lost, so they could not build any more. Is that true? I don't know the true answer to that. The answer I always give is that it's not true that a friend of mine has all of the plans under his bed. <laughs> Okay, both since we don't know if that's true. Uh, <laughs> do we know what causes the moon to have red rocks or dirt? Is it iron? I'm sure they know the answer to that question. I do not. Uh, iron, iron would certainly be a good uh, guess. Uh, they, they've, I mean, by bringing some of that stuff back, we, we have moon... We have lunar samples more than what the Apollo astronauts brought back. The Russians have brought back some small amounts, but there are meteorites where something has smashed into the moon, sent junk flying, and some of that falls back to Earth. And if I reach back here, uh, this rock I've got in my hands is definitely a meteorite and may be lunar origin. So there's my piece of the moon. Okay. Um, uh, someone in the chat has put in the Oak Park River Forest Museum, which at, with a link to the Kerwin webpage. So oh, if anyone's cool. interested, that is okay. in the chat right now. Okay. And then someone wants to know, and I don't know if you'll know this one or not, uh, does Triton have any serious space studies? I know I, I personally have been in the, in the CERN Center, and I know mm -hmm. that they have a like an, a dome and you can do space they, they, shows. They have there. a planetarium. They do planetarium shows there. I don't think they've reopened from COVID yet, but they're getting ready to. They have a hallway corridor with a lot of artifacts in it. You know, is it a serious space museum like Adler or like the Crown Center down at Museum of Science and Industry? No, 
Do they have detailed space programs? This it, it, it's a community college, so again, you know, they're not going to have astronautics courses. They might, they I'm sure they have an astronomy course or something like that, but they're not going to have rocket science courses. Okay. Um, um, just looked up about Apollo Soyuz. Brand and Stafford are the only ones still alive yes. from both mm -hmm. the American and Russian side. Yep. Mm -hmm. okay. I knew Slayton was gone. I knew, uh, I thought Kubasev had passed away. And I remember hearing that Leonov just recently passed away. Uh, and, and again, you know, talk, you know, I, I missed the launch of it in Florida by a month. And I was actually at the Stafford Museum a month after their 40th reunion when I believe three of them were there. That's pretty cool. I know it was it was before Leon of had passed away. I don't know about the fourth one. I know Slayton was long gone by then. Uh, you know, but you know, missed the launch by a month and missed the 40th reunion by a month. <laughs> uh, for, for a little teeny museum in Weatherford, Oklahoma, the Stafford Museum is worth the trip if you're anywhere near there. Excellent. I did not even but know about that. I was supposed to go back there last year for a space group gathering. And of course, everybody knows that nothing happened last year. The most useful thing anybody bought was a 2020 planet planner calendar. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so let, let's take a look at living okay. in space. Yeah, so, we are we are done with the question for now, so. Okay, so on. now we, we got Skylab, which was a short time living in space. So a couple things ended up happening. First of all, we decided to build this space shuttle Unfortunately, it was, you know, like, like too many other things, it was over budget, it was behind schedule, it never lived up to all of its goals and promises. Uh, the uh, drop test one that didn't fly in space, uh, the Star Trek fans, uh, you see a large portion of the cast here, uh, lobbied to get it renamed the Enterprise. I thought it would have been a more fitting tribute if they picked one of the ones that actually flew, but uh, the drop test one uh, ended up being named for the Enterprise. And uh, Nichelle Nichols, right in the front here, ended up doing a lot of recruiting for NASA, bringing in women and minorities, and pretty much twisting NASA management's arm and telling them, you better hire some of these folks. So once you start looking at the shuttle program and beyond, you'll see NASA looking much more like a cross-section of America than the original astronauts that were all white male test pilots. So space shuttle flew for the first time in April of 81. Uh, two men on board, John Young, who would, as I said, had walked on the moon and Crippen. Uh, just a two day flight, check everything out. Uh, only two space shuttle flights, one and two, had the tank painted white. So what happened here? Uh, that paint weighed about 2,000 pounds. If you take 2,000 pounds of weight off the tank, that tank goes almost all the way to orbit. If you take 2,000 pounds of weight off that tank, you can take 2,000 pounds more of payload inside the orbiter to orbit. And that's what they did. But we had this first reusable flight. It made a second flight. Uh, Early flights landed uh, at uh, Edwards Air Force Base in the, in the desert where they had a huge open space. So if you missed the runway or were at the wrong angle or something, you still had a safe place to land. Eventually they started landing back at the Kennedy Space Center on a three mile runway there, which vastly reduced the turnaround time. Flight number three, they had bad weather in California you know, waved it off a day, waved it off another day, and finally landed at uh, White Sands, New Mexico, the only shuttle flight to land there. Uh, started doing some interesting things with the shuttle flight. So here you can see Bruce McCandless uh, as the human satellite. Uh, this was the first untethered spacewalk. He had spent a lot of time developing this backpack. He was actually one of the Apollo era astronauts that never got to fly during Apollo and shuttle. There, 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 I'm sorry, Apollo or Skylab. Uh, there were several astronauts that were supposed to fly, you know, were part of the Apollo era that 
didn't get to fly until shuttle flights. And then of course, in January of 86, we had the Challenger disaster where uh, the solid booster burned through, ignited the tank and destroyed the rocket and uh, seven American astronauts perished on the way up. I was what, 77 seconds into flight. Uh, uh, so these are them. And of course the Challenger centers, uh, we had the teacher in space on this flight, Krista McAuliffe and uh, the Challenger centers were set up in her memory as uh, space education. And interestingly enough, I first put this presentation together for them, uh, the one up in Woodstock. Uh, shuttle did a lot of things. It brought a lot of interesting payloads into space. Uh, but one of the interesting things they ended up doing, more detente in space, is several shuttle flights visited the Russian Mir space station. Uh, so the reason I've included this picture is STS-79, uh, Shannon Lucid, she was not the first American to visit the space station, but she spent five months up there. It was supposed to be three months and her flight home was late. But STS-79 ended up being the fourth and final flight that an old friend of mine made. So he brought Shannon Lucid home and got to spend a week on Mirror. I got up early every morning while Atlantis was either docked with Mirror or the night after they undocked coming home and every morning got up and looked at that dot flying across the sky over the Chicago skies. And then that last night after they undocked, I could see the two separate dots flying by. You can see the space station from Chicago. When it flies directly overhead, it's brighter than anything in the sky except the moon or the sun. And it's so bright now I've heard some, I haven't seen it during the day, but some people have. Uh, we also used the space shuttle to build the International Space Station. Some of parts were sent up on Russian rockets. Uh, some were brought up by the space shuttle. Uh, this is one of the middle construction projects. It's got all of the solar panels now, uh, but they've added some more stuff on since then. Uh, the last shuttle flights finished it off. This space station you're looking at there, if you set that down, that would just about fill a football field. It's that big. And again, when it flies overhead, it, it, it's brighter than Venus, which other than the moon would be the brightest thing in the, in the night sky. Uh, unfortunately, we had another accident where uh, some foam from that tank didn't get painted, came off and damaged the wing. And uh, another shuttle was destroyed from that. And seven more American astronauts lost their lives. Uh, we did continue to fly the shuttle enough to get the space station built. but. After that, I mean, we, we've gone, we're, we're now at a stage of space flight where lots more folks are getting involved. So the Chinese have started flying spacecraft. So this is their Shenzhou rocket. Uh, this was their first, they, uh, the Chinese call, the, the Russians call them cosmonauts, the Chinese call them taikonauts. So this was the first Chinese taikonaut into space. They have built two space stations so far. I've seen them fly over Chicago as well. I'll tell you later on how you can see that. Let me make a note here. Remind me later to tell you how to see space stations. Where did my pen go? I want to make sure I mention that. Oh, we've had commercial space flight now. Uh, so Spaceship One was uh, built to win the X Prize, which was a challenge set out to build a spaceship capable of carrying three, didn't have to carry three people, it had to be capable of carrying three people, and to make two space flights within a two week period. Something that even the, the space shuttle was never able to fly twice in 14 days. So uh, Bert Rutan, who also built the first plane to fly around, the built the only two planes that have flown around the world nonstop, designed and built this spacecraft, Spaceship One. Uh, it's actually carried up by an airplane and dropped off an airplane kind of like the X-15 was. Uh, it's first flight to actually reach space and we're again using that 62 mile, 100 kilometer line was June 4th flown by Mike Melville. It flew again on September 4th also with Mike. And then less than two weeks later on October 4th, Brian Binney who's shown here flew it 
and uh, not only won the X Prize, but flew it higher than the highest X-15 flight, making it the highest winged atmospheric rocket flight. This is now hanging in the Smithsonian right next to the X-15 and above the Apollo 11 capsule. Uh, more recent flights, uh, uh, SpaceX with their Falcon 9 <coughs> has amazed folks with their recovery, you know, with their reusable rockets and landing. But uh, just over, not quite a year ago, flew the first uh, Falcon 9 Dragon flight to carry men back to the space station. <coughs> Excuse me. So interesting thing here, uh, you can see them uh, entering the space station through here, but this American flag that's over the hatch, that was left, that was, that American flag was flown on the first space shuttle flight back in 1981. It was flown again on the last space shuttle flight and left behind on the space station, kind of a uh, space capture the flag game as a challenge for the first American launched rocket to return to the space station and bring it home. So Bob and Doug brought that flag back home. And I don't know if that's back at the Kennedy Space Center or if that ended up in the museum or where it ended up. Uh, should probably track that down. Uh, but from the end of the space shuttle program up until last year, and even now, the only way we had to get to and from the International Space Station was on the Russian rockets. And uh, now we have American rockets that can get us there. And we're working to get other rockets up there. Uh, Boeing's working on something, and uh, other folks are working on it. But we're now flying back to the space station with an American rocket. Uh, so let me pause here, and then we'll go on to exploring the solar system. Any questions at this point? Trying to compress uh, we have, 30 years um, of sh shuttle flight into a very short time here. This is yes? more um, informational. Uh, it's got some Wikipedia and YouTube um, links on it. It's in the Q&A if you guys can access it. It's BBC has a good docudrama made in 2005 about the space race showing what the Russians were doing at the same time that the Americans were doing with mm -hmm. Werner von Braun in Germany going up to 69. And then there's mm -hmm. a Wikipedia link and YouTube episodes. So if people are interested in yep. that. Um, question though, why is China not allowed to participate on the International Space Station? Politics, not my domain. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. I'm going to see if I can copy these Wikipedia links. No, I cannot. I do not think I can. No, sorry, I cannot. You don't have the little three dots to let you save the chat at the end? Mm, this is in the Q&A, not in the oh, chat. Oh, OK. Don't I think I don't can. know how that part works. So yeah, I, I don't think I can do that. that. But, uh, um, the, the, the Russian equivalent of Warner von Braun was Sergei Korolev. And he died suddenly in 1966. And that seriously impacted their space program and development of future rockets. And in fact, the, the, the rockets that the Russians are using today to go to the space station and do everything else is pretty much the same rocket that launched Sputnik 1 and that launched uh, Vostok 1 back in 1957 and 1962 time frame. They, the, when, when Russia develops technology, they just keep using it over and over again. And if it works, they don't mess with it. So they're still using very old technology stuff, but it works. Um, they were nice enough to replace their info in the chat. So if you want that information on YouTube, etc., cetera, oh. on chat, mm -hmm. and one comment about the space station being so bright that you really can't miss it. Yep. And when it flies on. directly overhead, it's very bright. Might as well tell you about that now. Because uh, uh, I have one other thing I'm looking for. You tell I'm, us. I'm going to I'm going to tell you about well a website and a place. If you just Google the words "spot the station," it, it's part of NASA's website. But if you go there and then register there, and it doesn't let you put everything in. So I live in Dundee. I can't put in Dundee. 
but I can put in Elgin, which is pretty close to me. And as it turns out, just about anything for the Chicago area is going to give you the same results. I will get I get an email from NASA every time the space station will be visible from where I live. And the other website I use is one called heavens dash above, not underscore, but dash above dot com. It's actually run by the German Space Agency. That will tell me every single satellite I could see tonight if it was clear from where I live. And you can put your location, whether it's you know Dundee or Chicago or Harwood Heights or Cleveland or wherever you might be. It's as I said, it's run by the German Space Agent. Really nice website. It'll show you what the night sky looks like. It'll show you lots of useful things. The one thing I want to let you know about is it'll give you a map of the sky. And just like you're used to, north is on top, south is on the bottom, but it flip-flops east and west. So east will be on the left and west will be on the right. So why would they do that? And the answer is that if you print it out on a piece of paper or you hold your tablet or your smartphone over your head and look up, it's now got the right orientation. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. I, last summer when we had the comet, that's what I used to tell me where the comet was. Uh, when there's anything interesting going on in the sky, that's the site I go to to find out where to see it. And that's what, what I look when, when the, when the uh, Chinese space station was up there, that's what I used to find that. When my friend was on the space shuttle with the Russian mirror, that's the site I went to to see when I could see that. I, I, I couldn't even tell you how many times I saw the space shuttle or the Mir space station or the International Space Station since then, but that's the only time where there was somebody up there that knew me, which I thought was pretty cool. Um, so let's move on to exploring the solar system at this point. Let me ask you one other thing. Sure. Do you see those space stations with the naked eye or do you need a telescope? Naked eye. You're, okay. A, a telescope actually makes it harder. I mean, but binoculars reduce your field of view and a telescope further reduces your field of view. So okay. you can't see enough of the sky to find something that's moving. And this, this, this moves about as fast as a jet flying high altitude overhead. It'll go from one, if it's going directly overhead, it'll go from one horizon to the other in about six minutes. But unlike a jet, there's no blinking lights on it and there's no noise. Okay. And both Spot the Station and Heavens Above are now in chat, courtesy of Chris. Okay, great. Chris. Thank you, Chris. So uh, early exploration, uh, we built some Mariner probes, uh, not very sophisticated at all by today's standards, but this was 1962 and 1965, flew by Venus, flew by Mars. And our, our, by the way, our approach for exploration of anything off the Earth whether it's the moon or Mars or anything else, is first we fly by it, then we orbit it, then we land on it, then we explore it. So here's our first Mars flyby in July of 1965. And the Russians had probes doing this too, but I'm mostly looking at the US stuff here. Uh, we sent Pioneer 10 and 11 to go past Jupiter and Saturn. And again, this isn't the real one. This is the one in the museum that's a mock-up or an engineering model or something like that. Uh, and these returned our first close-up images of Jupiter and Saturn. Uh, Pioneer probes had this interesting drawing on it uh, of uh, the spacecraft itself, which you can see down here. This, our solar system showing where it came from and where it went, that it flew by Jupiter and Saturn, pictures of people, these funny line drawings, these are pulsar references uh, that we thought might be useful for somebody to navigate that wasn't from Earth. Uh, after orbiting Mars, we sent the Viking 1 and Viking 2 landers to land on Mars. Uh, was originally supposed to land on July 4th, which was the bicentennial, but it was delayed a bit. So it, it, it was orbiting Mars by the bicentennial and it ended up landing on the anniversary of the moon landing, which was an appropriate thing to do. Another one of those interesting coincidences, the first shuttle flight uh, was delayed two days 
and ended up flying on the 20th anniversary of Yuri Gagarin's first human in space flight. So lots of interesting anniversaries where they do things like that. So we uh, got, you know, landed on Mars successfully. Uh, we sent the two Voyager programs on this large Titan III rocket uh, to go on the grand tour. Uh, they went past Jupiter. Voyager 2 was actually launched first, but took a slightly longer path. So Voyager 1 launched a month later, actually got there first. Uh, both flew by Jupiter and Saturn. Voyager 1 also threw, flew by Saturn's moon Titan, which we were really interested in seeing. But in order to go by Titan, we couldn't go any further. Voyager 2, because we got the information we wanted from Titan, could go then past Uranus and Neptune. So this is what the probe looks like. Uh, the Voyager probes carried this golden record. I think this was Carl Sagan's work. Uh, it carried, you know, some of the same drawings, this pulsar diagram, uh, uh, instructions on how to play the record for some alien civilization. And it carried lots of sound from the earth, from all over the world, uh, including Chuck Berry. So where are they now? So this is from that Heavens Above website. And apologies, these are from July of 29, from 2009, when I first put this presentation together. So they've all traveled a lot farther since then. But if you go to heavensabove.com, one of the things you can do is get current copies of this drawing. So this shows you our solar system. It ignores the whole inner solar system. So you just see Saturn, Uranus, Neptune, Pluto orbits. So Voyager 1 is now probably somewhere way down here. Voyager 2 out here, Pioneer 11 and 10. And you've got New Horizons here. It hasn't gotten to Pluto yet. Obviously, it has now. Uh, but Voyager 1 and Voyager 2 are the farthest things that we've sent out. They are going faster than any of the other three, so they will remain in the lead until we develop some new technology that can go even faster. Uh, I have a friend. His name is Ted Cochran. I'm waiting for his grandson, Zephram, to invent warp drive and get us there in 2063. We sent the Galileo probe to Jupiter. Uh, this was delayed. It was sent by the, it was launched from the space shuttle. Uh, after Challenger, we decided we weren't going to use the space shuttle to launch uh, satellites anymore. It was too risky, but this had been designed and had been post delayed. So it was still launched from the space shuttle. We actually had to put a live rocket motor inside the space shuttle cargo bay. And that's something that other than this probe, they said, we're not going to do anymore. Uh, but this flew by Jupiter and spent many years orbiting Jupiter, collecting lots of information. And eventually, uh, just like Cassini a couple of years ago, was uh, burned up in the Jupiter atmosphere. Uh, one of the things worth knowing is we've got all these planetary protection laws. So back during the Apollo era, when the Apollo, when the first Apollo astronauts came back from the moon, we quarantined them for three weeks to make sure that they weren't bringing back some moon bug that was going to make everybody sick. And just like we need to protect the Earth from everything else, we want to protect all these other interesting places from the Earth. So with Mars, and not so much with Jupiter and Saturn because they're gas giants and life as we know it can't exist there, but some of their moons are interesting and we wanna make sure we don't crash things accidentally into one of those moons. So when a spacecraft has outlived its usefulness, we destroy it somehow or get rid of it so that it's not a danger to the stuff we might wanna study someday. You know, if we get to Titan or Europa and we find life there, we want to know this is life that came from somewhere else and not earth contaminant that somehow got brought there. Uh, next Mars lander was the Pathfinder spacecraft. Uh, used these air, this airbag thingy. And again, this is the one that's in the JPL lobby in California, not the one on Mars, because we haven't been there yet to get it. But just like we've got the Ingenuity helicopter on uh, Perseverance, uh, this carried the Sojourner rover as a technology demonstration. It wasn't part of the mission. It was just a question of, can we get a rover to work on Mars? Well, the answer was yes. And all the rovers we've done since then have been, you know, the uh, children and grandchildren of this one. To give you a size idea, this rover is about the size of a small microwave oven or maybe a large toaster oven. Very small, but 
it worked successfully. Here's a picture of it on Mars. A friend of mine actually worked on this project. And this little corner here, you can see something funny on that corner. That was his experiment. It measured how much energy the solar cells produced. From that, he determined how fast they were getting dirty and how long it would last. Based on that, they made the solar cells on Spirit and Opportunity bigger. And we all know that they lasted a lot longer than they were supposed to. So here's the Cassini probe. Uh, this was the probe we sent to Saturn to orbit Saturn. Spent, uh, we launched it in 97. I believe it got there in 2004. It continued doing science until 2017 when it ran out of fuel and was crashed back or was sent back into Saturn to burn up. Uh, you'll see this saucer thing on the side. This is the Huygens probe, which actually landed on Saturn's moon Titan, which might be the place in the solar system most like Earth. It's got an atmosphere that's mostly methane, but it's about 1.5 times the pressure of Earth. So we might actually be able to land on Titan and do interesting things or fly there. Be easier than flying on Mars. Here's one of my favorite pictures from uh, Cassini. This is actually one of my desktop back backgrounds. Uh, this was taken by Cassini when it was on the opposite side of Saturn from the sun. So it's actually in a total eclipse in the dark, but you can see the rings illuminated by the sun and you can see Saturn illuminated by ring shine. If you've ever been out on a dark night when there's a full moon, moonshine, you can see your shadow from the moonshine. Well, on Saturn, you'd never have a dark night because the rings would always be there lighting everything up. Oh, really cool part about this picture. Uh, you can see this faint ring here. This was actually discovered in this picture. And one of Saturn's moons is actually sending ice geysers into space and creating this new ring. But you see this little dot here? You are here. That's the Earth from Saturn. That's how small we look from there. So if you remember what the Earth looked like from the moon, now we've got this teeny dot. Uh, when, when the Voyager probes were heading out of the solar system, again, Carl Sagan's idea, have them turn around and take a final picture. And one of the pictures they took was of the Earth leaving the sol as that was leaving the solar system. Here's a picture from the Huygens lander as it's coming down to Titan. Or, and uh, it, it only had batteries. It only lasted for a few hours once it got there. But this gave us our first images of another world, uh, or at least of another world that far out. We had seen Mars already. Uh, the uh, space shuttle was used to launch, well, we launched four great observatories, three of them from the space shuttle. Uh, the most famous being the Hubble telescope, some amazing pictures from the Hubble telescope. Uh, five missions to service it, the first one to give it contact lenses after they screwed up the optics on it, and then four more service missions to extend its life. It's now just had its 30 year anniversary, in, but actually 31 year anniversary in space, still working, still sending back amazing pictures. Uh, important thing to realize about Hubble, it's actually a black and white camera. We get color by using different filters on it and by interpreting the data from it. So somebody by hand has to Photoshop all those pictures to get that color. So what you're seeing isn't real color, but they look at three different frequencies and map them to different colors to produce that. It's referred to in uh, astrophotography terms as the Hubble palette, uh, the three brightest uh, sources. Uh, so here's pictures of one of the service missions from the Hubble telescope. Uh, one of the lesser known great observatories that's my favorite for, again, obvious reasons, is the Compton Gamma Ray Observatory. This was launched by STS-37 in April of 91. I went to Florida for this launch. There was a problem when they deployed this satellite. One of the antennas didn't open. So the two astronauts had to go take an emergency spacewalk to shake it loose. So one of them is here on the end of the arm, I believe. The other one's in the payload bay. Uh, this guy in the payload bay is my old friend. Uh, I knew him for about a decade before he became an astronaut. 
So had to go down to Florida to see his launch. Uh, the Chandra X-ray Observatory is the third of the great observatories. So visible light we can see from the surface of the Earth, but infrared and X-rays and gamma rays, our atmosphere blocks all of those so we can't see them. So really the only way we can see these things is to go into space. And then there's the Spitzer Infrared Telescope. I believe this is the one that wasn't launched by the shuttle and is not in Earth orbit, was in a different orbit, uh, actually in orbit around the sun. And uh, it produced data for many years and was recently uh, uh, stopped functioning. The uh, Compton Gamma Ray Telescope was replaced by the Fermi Gamma Ray Telescope. Uh, which was one of the things that recently detected uh, with LIGO. They've been detecting the, uh, uh, new, the black hole mergers and now neutron star mergers. And that uh, Fermi telescope was instrumental in the uh, neutron star merger a few years ago. Uh, so we got two more Mars rovers, Spirit and Opportunity. These were supposed to be 90 day missions on Mars. Uh, Spirit lasted for six years. Again, they made the solar panels bigger based on the data that my friend gathered from Sojourner. And opportunity lasted for 14 years. So here, you know, unfortunately in this format, I can't do question and answer with you, but here's a question to think about for a minute. How far did opportunity travel in 14 years? And the answer is about 28 miles. So the, the Apollo 17 rover, the last of the three lunar rovers, it took opportunity 12 of those 14 years to travel as far as that Apollo, 15, Apollo 17 rover traveled in three days. So why do we send men to space or people into space instead of robots? And the answer is they're so much flexible and they can do so much more stuff. On Mars, because of the time delay, we can't drive this thing like you drive a radio controlled car. There's anywhere from 10 minutes to half an hour delay one way, double that round trip. So these things have to drive on, them, drive on their own and they're very slow. They move a tiny fraction of a mile an hour. So it takes a long time to go someplace on Mars with these rovers. Interesting pictures from Mars. Uh, if you see by that arrow, you can see a dust devil on Mars. Uh, there's these storms on Mars that conveniently blow dust off solar panels sometimes. Uh, the Phoenix lander uh, was sent near the Martian pole. One of NASA's goals is in order to find life on other planets, we're looking for water and all, all life on Earth depends on water, and we think it would elsewhere. So we were looking for water on Mars, and we didn't. There, there's all this evidence that water used to be on Mars, but the question was, is it currently there? So by sending it to those polar ice caps, that ice that we see from Mars is mostly carbon dioxide ice. But this lander did, wasn't a rover, didn't need to move around. We figured anywhere it landed would be good enough. But it had one of those shovels to dig into the surface of Mars. And when they dug in, they found ice under the surface. It also had a camera on that arm and could look at its legs underneath. And after the Martian night, when you look at the rover in the morning, or not the rover, at the lander in the morning, they found ice collected on the legs of the lander. So yes, we have found water on Mars. And of course, we sent bigger, better rovers to Mars. Uh, so the Curiosity rover in 2012, it's been on Mars for about eight years now. It takes about eight months to get to Mars. Uh, uh, so much bigger rover, much more capable, nuclear powered now. So instead of solar cells, if you see this white thing on the back, that's the nuclear power source. So now we don't have to worry about solar cells getting black. We don't have to worry about storms uh, covering the solar cells. And it's been working on Mars for about eight years now. We just landed Perseverance on Mars. Uh, this is the sky crane view, a view that we didn't get last time, but they added some cameras. 
And of course, it's got the helicopter on it, which has been in the news the past few days. Uh, I don't think I have a picture of the helicopter in here. Uh, basically the same platform as Curiosity, but with different science instrument, instruments and more stuff. And it's also going to enable sample return. It's going to collect samples on Mars, and then we're going to send something to get those samples and bring them back to the Earth. So here's the size picture. This, this is at JPL in California. This is what they call their Mars yard. It's where they test out Mars rovers on Earth. So you can see the little sojourner over here, Spirit and Opportunity. Uh, this is Curiosity, but Perseverance is about the same size. And a human here, so that you can see the scale of these to give you an idea of what they look like. One last picture I wanted to show you. We've got some uh, lunar orbiters orbiting the moon again to get pictures for our return to the moon. And one of the things they've done is they've imaged all of the Apollo lunar landing sites. So I just happened to pick 14 because that was one of the more interesting ones. But in these images, you can see the sh you can see the lunar module and its shadow. And remember, this is just the bottom half, the descent engine. You can see the footprints where the astronauts walked back and forth on the lunar surface. If you go out on a brand new snowfall and you walk back and forth, or if the deer wander through your yard where you live or some other critters, you can see the footprint trails left behind. We can see the footprints of where the astronauts walked. We can see the scientific instruments they left behind. We can see the rovers on the ones that left rovers behind. So here we've got photographic evidence proving that we really did go to the moon back in 69 and 70. And the, I guess this is the last image I got. I forgot to add this when I gave this talk a couple of weeks ago. Uh, the last place we just recently visited, the last planet, dwarf planet, whatever, I still call it a planet, is Pluto, which we explored a few years ago back in 2015. Uh, the New Horizons craft visited it and then went on to visit other Kuiper Belt objects, and it's still out there returning data. And they're still looking for other things that might be close enough to its path to exhibit. So that's the end of my talk. Uh, any more questions? Or do I get to tell uh, Alan Stern's story about why Pluto is a planet? You can tell that in just a second, but... Uh... <laughs> yeah, let's take care of questions first. So there is, okay, regarding the portion of Apollo 13 that had the oxygen tanks, did that burn up in orbit or is it still out in space? Uh, well, it, 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 they used the lunar module to get home. They, they separated the, com the command module from the service module just before re-entry and it would have burned up in the Earth's atmosphere, I think. I'm pretty sure that one, I'm pretty sure those things burned up in the Earth's atmosphere. The lunar module, well, the descent stage of the lunar module is normally left on the surface of the moon. The ascent stage ends up in lunar orbit. And what they would do on the successful Apollo missions is they would then fire the descent stage and crash it back into the moon because one of the scientific instruments we left on the moon at all of the landing sites was a seismometer to find moonquakes. Can't call them earthquakes because they're on the moon, so we got to call them moonquakes. <laughs> so the, the Apollo 13 lunar module didn't get left behind on the moon, and it did re-enter the Earth's atmosphere. And just like uh, uh, the two Mars rovers have nuclear power plants, we had nuclear power plants. I don't think Apollo 11 had it, but all the rest of the Apollo landing sites had a nuclear power plant left behind to power those things. The nuclear power, the core that had that nuclear material in it was extremely well insulated. And that would have survived the landing and would have ended up on the bottom of the Pacific Ocean. Hmm. Wow. Any other okay. questions? Um, a comment about Radiolab that had an episode about the creation of the Voyager Golden Records. That mm -hmm. link is in the chat from Great. Trip. I got all um, these helpers putting information in there for me. Thank yes. you. Yes. And everything else is saying just it was a great presentation and thank you so much. Oh, thank you. So so let me tell you what, what Alan Stern said. Yes. Uh, there, there, there was an event earlier this year called Pluto Fest. <laughs> and of course, Alan Stern had to kick. Alan Stern was the project lead, leader for the uh, New Horizons probe that went to uh, Pluto. 
Uh, and he still holds up nine fingers when he talks about Pluto. So the, the test he has, uh, all of the planetary scientists still refer to Pluto as a planet. It's just the IAU that doesn't. And they, you know, again, it's a political thing and they got their heads twisted wrong or something or other. <laughs> but the, what Alan, Stern, Alan Stern's comment is what he called the Star Trek test. When the Enterprise with Captain Kirk approached an object, you didn't need any set of rules to tell, are we looking at a star? Are we looking at a planet? Are we looking at an asteroid? Are we looking at a comet? Are we looking at a spaceship? You could look at it and tell what it was. <laughs> and his argument is that's the way we should determine what's a planet is by looking at it. Uh, one, one of, interesting thing, if, we, if you took Earth and put it out in the Kuiper Belt past, past Pluto, it would no longer meet the IAU definition of being a planet just because of where it is, not because mm -hmm. of what it is. And that's wrong, I think and he thinks. Uh, there, they, they, they came up with three rules for what a planet should be. The first is it has to orbit the sun, and that's good. Mm -hmm. The second one, it has to have enough gravity that it ended up making something that's round. And the Earth is round, and Pluto is round, and all the other planets are round. Mm -hmm. Most asteroids are not round. One of them is, but most of them are not, because they don't have enough gravity. Mm -hmm. The third thing they said is it's got to have enough gravity to clear its orbit. Well, Pluto doesn't do that because there's all these Kuiper belt things that we discovered. And actually when Ceres, the asteroid was found, we called, initially we called that a planet. And then we found Vesta and then we found Pallas and then we found lots more asteroids. And we realized that this asteroid belt wasn't a bunch of planets in the same orbit, it was something else. So that, you know, Years ago, many years ago, Ceres got declassified as a planet. But all the rest of these asteroids are not round because they're not big enough to, for gravity to do its thing. Pluto is. In Jupiter's orbit, there are Trojan asteroids. So Jupiter, the biggest planet in the solar system, has not cleared its orbit. So by the AAU's own definition, Jupiter shouldn't be a planet. Well, how can that be? So the answer, I think, Alan Stern thinks and planetary scientists think is those first two rules are perfectly good. And the third one basically tells you not what it is, but where it is. And we should drop that one. And then Pluto can be a planet again. I think Pluto should be a planet. No. What do you think, I'm going to probably say this wrong, Umu Amu was. That's O U M U A M U A. Yes, I, the, 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 the hunk of space junk that came flying through the inner solar system. Okay. I don't know a whole lot about it. The theories are that it's some random piece of space debris that's not part of our solar system or part of any other solar system that just, it, it, it's the stray dog that came wandering through our backyard. It's not Is it an dog. alien technology like Ave well, Lowe. not alien technology, <laughs> but it's just it's just some piece of stuff that isn't gravitationally bound to our solar system or any other solar system and just came wandering through the neighborhood. Hmm. You know, uh, I don't think we got close enough to it to find out a whole lot of information about it. I mean, it, it wasn't really close to Earth. It was close enough they could see it but not close enough that they could study it really well. Uh, it's one of those mysteries that we'd love to know more about, but it's one of those things that we just don't know a whole lot about. I'm gonna stop screen sharing here so that, oh, I, sure. guess, I guess now people can see my face a little better. They oh, and I can see the chat. And I can click on the three dots and save all this wonderful stuff you've been throwing out there for me. You can, you can. Mm -hmm. Um, then you see the one about Eris. Is uh, Eris too far away to be considered a planet? Uh, okay. <laughs> Eris was discovered by Mike Brown. Mike Brown is the guy whose Twitter handle is Pluto Killer and whose book is 
how I killed Pluto and why it had to die. And he specifically <laughs> set out looking for a Kuiper belt object bigger than Pluto so that he could dethrone it. Uh, uh, I actually took a uh, solar system course from him. And, uh, you know, just like anybody, I mean, he, he's like any other high level professor, planetary scientist you'd find, you know, he's got his attitude and his ideas and that's him. And that's the way it is with him. But I mean, he's a really sharp guy. Uh, <laughs> but uh, he, he set out to dethrone Pluto. <clears throat> so if, if you follow <clears throat> the definition that the planetary scientists, other than Mike Brown, there've been something like a hundred papers written on planetary science since Pluto was dethroned and all of them refer to Pluto as a planet Good. other than Mike Brown. Good. Uh, so if, if you go with uh, the Star Trek definition, Eris is a planet. So Mike Brown didn't discover a dwarf planet. He discovered another planet. Okay, that's all I see so far. Um, anybody else before we let this gentleman go? So I, the, the last thing I want to mention, just because it's it's what I do for fun when I'm not doing this stuff, is as, <laughs> as you mentioned during my intro, I've been building model rockets since I was a kid. And I'm the perfect example of what happens to a kid who never grows up. <laughs> and I think that's a good thing. Uh, uh, but, but between Carl Sagan and Neil deGrasse Tyson, they both said so many wonderful things that I sometimes forget who said what. But one of them said that we're all born scientists and that our education system beats that out of us and kills our curiosity. So I think kids should remain curious as adults. And then we have more scientists and engineers and all these other cool people. Whatever your passion is, do it. Uh, but... Uh, I just lost my train of thought here, didn't I? Uh, yes, I did. I do that. All oh, yes. Uh, uh, I've been building model rockets since I was a kid. I still do it. We've got two model rocket clubs in the Chicago area. If you go to our national organization, which is just nar.org, and click on the link that says find the club near me, you'll find the two Chicago area rocket clubs and a bunch of others. We're sort of still in COVID protocol at the moment, so... Mm -hmm. We're not really open to spectators, but hopefully later this year or certainly by next year, spectators will be welcome and you can come see folks flying real rockets that are anywhere from a few inches tall to uh, up in Woodstock, we're flying them where people fly things that are 10 feet tall, six inches around, and wow. we actually have to get FAA clearance to fly them. I, we oh, have to fill out the same paperwork they do for the Chicago Air Show. Oh, that's really fascinating. Mm -hmm. How high do those get? How, uh, how much money you got? <laughs> okay. All right. Okay. You know, for, 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 for 10 bucks, I can get you anywhere from a few hundred to a thousand feet high. Uh -huh. uh, for a hundred bucks, I can get you well over a mile high with a pretty large rocket. For a thousand bucks, I can get you several miles high. Interesting. That's fascinating. I used to fly model airplanes, so I'm finding that really okay. intriguing. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Well, um, I mean, the, the, early, the early astronauts, you know, Mercury, Gemini, Apollo, mm -hmm. I'm sure virtually every one of them flew model airplanes. The mm -hmm. shuttle astronauts and beyond, I mean, the guy I knew who made four shuttle flights, I know him because in 1975, we flew model rockets together. Yeah. And from, nice. from this hobby, I literally know people in every piece of the space program, you know, from astronauts to people who built these things to people who helped launch them. Uh, the cameras that they first used on the Delta rockets and that after Columbia, they started putting on the space shuttle to look for the foam damage. But you, you have this view, you're, you're looking down as Florida disappears from under you as the rocket launches and then you mm -hmm. see things coming off. The guy who first put one of those cameras on the Delta rockets that launched some of the satellites is an old friend of mine I met back in 1975. And back then he was putting Super 8 movie cameras on his model rockets. Wow. Wow. <laughs> That's cool. And I, I've, I've just met so many people that are in just, you know, a lot of them in STEM fields, but mm -hmm. 
but some of them are lawyers and some of them are bankers and other questionable things. But you no, know, but every piece of the aerospace industry, you know, including you know the guy the guy that flew in space four times, a guy that worked on three of the now five Mars rovers, uh, and everything else. Well, that is very cool. And, and, and I think the, we are out of questions. Yeah, the thing that's really great now, I hope people have been watching all of the Perseverance stuff and you know, the, you know, the SpaceX Dragon, you know, the crew flights to the space station. The thing that is really great in my opinion is when you look at the people in the rooms that are sending these things. If you look at the people that were in the room when Perseverance landed on Mars, it looks much more like a cross section of real America than what you saw in the 60s and 70s. Good. And that's a good thing. That's a great thing. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you for so having much. me. And, uh, uh, you know, keep watching what's going on because NASA, I, I keep having to update this presentation because NASA keeps making more history for us to look at. And which is a good thing. It, Thank it you so much, sir. Really, you're, you're really fascinating. Welcome. Really great. Thank you. Take care. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.